Good evening and welcome to the Princeton University Chapel. My name is Peter Carter and I'm the director of the Catholic Sacred Music Project, which is organizing this evening along with the Durandus Institute and many other co-sponsors who are listed in your program. I'm very grateful to Father Zach Swantek, the director of the Aquinas Institute, for hosting and for making possible this evening's celebration of Sarum Vespers. To begin our presentation uh, on this evening's liturgy, I'd first like to introduce James Griffin, who's the founder and director of the Durandus Institute for Sacred Liturgy and Music. He's a lifelong student, writer, and enthusiast of traditional ceremonies of Christian worship, especially those from the Middle Ages. James is also a Knight of the Order of Malta and a liturgical coordinator for St. John, Bapt John the Baptist Parish in Bridgeport, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, which is a church in the ordinariate of the chair of St. Peter, erected by Pope Benedict XVI for former Anglicans to come into full communion with the Catholic Church. One hundred years ago, in 1924, a ground was broken here in this place to begin the construction of the very chapel in which we now stand. Under the design and direction of architect Ralph Adams Cram, the chapel of Princeton University was an expression of the collegiate Gothic revival, which Cram, like Augustus Welby Pugin and other medieval revivalist architects of the Victorian era, believed was a necessary corrective for a world dominated by heavy industry and modernism. The Princeton Chapel was consciously modeled after the collegiate chapels of the late Gothic and early Tudor eras of England, such as those of King's College, Cambridge, and Magdalen College, Oxford. What better place in America, then, could there be to celebrate a liturgical rite that resounded daily in those chapels of England's great medieval universities? Those of you joining us tonight are about to step 500 years into the past. Tonight's form of Vespers, or evening prayer according to the divine office, follows the ritual of the use of Salisbury, also known by its name in Latin as Sarum. You may be wondering, what makes this so special when compared to offerings at the average local Catholic church? First, it must be said that having Vespers at all is now a foreign experience at all but some of the greatest cathedrals of Europe, monasteries, and certain churches under the care of special religious congregations with a strong liturgical charism. Where once it was a natural part of the church's life to have Vespers, at least on Sundays, a practice which even the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s says was to be maintained and fostered, Yet the everyday realities of life in Catholic parish churches has restricted Vespers to, essentially, an obligation that priests read from a book in between their daily tasks. It is rather the Eastern Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches that have managed to retain Vespers as a normal expression of common faith. In the West, it has been the Church of England and its American counterpart, the Episcopal Church, that has managed to best preserve the practice of singing Vespers publicly in the form known as Evensong in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. Choral Evensong is still sung regularly to the highest standards of choirs of men and boys at such institutions as Westminster Abbey or King's College Cambridge, which perhaps is the only university chapel on earth larger than the one in which we now sit and in America at St. Thomas Episcopal on Fifth Avenue in New York City, which I might add was also a design of Ralph Adams Cram. But the primary source from which Thomas Cranmer developed Evensong and his other liturgies for the Book of Common Prayer was the liturgy in force throughout most of England on the eve of the Reformation, the use of Salisbury, the use of Sarum, Why, you may ask, did England have a different standard of worship than the rest of the Catholic world? Most Catholics alive today are accustomed to a uniformity of worship, at least in theory, if not in practice. In response to the confusions following the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, the popes of Rome saw it as necessary to promote a common standard of worship throughout Catholic Europe by offering the Roman Rite, 
specifically the liturgical books of the Roman Curia, which later became known commonly as the Tridentine Rite for having followed the conclusion of the Council of Trent. Thanks to the efforts of Franciscan and Jesuit missionaries who adopted the Tridentine books and spread their use in missions across Latin America, Asia, and indeed the entire world, by the time of the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, as much as one-sixth of the entire world's population was accustomed to the rhythms and cadences of the Catholic Mass as codified by the Council of Trent. Such a feat could only have been possible by the invention of the printing press, an instrument which, it's commonly said, provided the means for the Protestant Reformation itself. So, in the Catholic Church of Medieval Europe, where every book had to be copied painstakingly by hand um, and was so valuable as to be carefully preserved for hundreds of years at a time. Such a level of liturgical uniformity was just not possible. Neither was it possible in an age before instant communication for the Holy See in Rome to practically command such a level of oversight as what took place at the parish level that it does now. On the contrary, when steps toward uniformity were taken in medieval Christendom, most notably when Charlemagne attempted to enforce the use of the Roman rite throughout his empire in the 8th century, the shift ended up influencing Rome itself with the popes themselves adopting customs from the Gallican rites of the Frankish kingdoms. The Gallican rites went on to inform many of the liturgical uses of Western Europe in the later Middle Ages, such as the use of Paris, the use of Leon, which I might add was the form of mass celebrated daily by St. John Marie Vianney even well into the 19th century, and the rites of the Dominican and Carmelite orders, some of whom still maintain to this day. It is from the Gallican rites as well that we receive the use of Sarum. Liturgical historians know fairly little about Christian liturgy in England under the rule of the Anglo-Saxons. But on the 14th of October, 1066, a fateful day in English history, an invading army from Normandy in the north of modern-day France, led by William the Conqueror, defeated the Saxon English under Harold Godwinson and established a new order so concrete, so lasting, that if and when the current Prince of Wales becomes king, he will be called William V, the fifth of his name to be crowned after the William who came across from Normandy in 1066. William the Conqueror brought not only Roman soldiers, but customs, language, law, architecture, and of course, worship. He worked to have St. Osmond, who, was, who had accompanied William during the invasion and served as chancellor under him, installed as Bishop of Salisbury in 1078. There, St. Osmond began construction on the old Cathedral of Sarum, adopting ceremonies for a cathedral chapter, which may perhaps have been taken from the Cathedral of Rouen, the capital of Normandy. Salisbury Cathedral soon became renowned for its richness of liturgical practice and the Ordinal of Osmond was adopted by many other church institutions throughout Southern England. Those of you with programs in hand may see the quotation I provided in the description of Sarum on page three from the 10th Bishop of Salisbury, Gilles de Bridport, who wrote, "'Among the churches of the whole world, "'the church of Sarum hath shone resplendent "'like the sun in his full orb, "'in respect of its divine service and its ministers.'" The Sarum use was adopted by England's first see of Canterbury through the 1300s and, and eventually became the predominant form throughout England and Ireland. At the time of King Henry VIII's death in 1547, the Sarum use was mandated for every diocese in the kingdom, save for the city of York. That is to say that yes, indeed, contrary to what may be popularly assumed about the English Reformation, Henry VIII did not abandon the use of all Latin liturgy. On the contrary, he maintained the use of the Latin Mass and the Divine Office through the use of Sarum in the Church of England until his death. Regarding Vespers in particular, many of the ceremonies at tonight's, events are, tonight's event are best understood in reference to how a cathedral chapter of canons, that is to say, the body of priests residing at a cathedral like Salisbury, or a collegiate foundation like King's College, Cambridge, went about their daily obligation of singing the divine office for the welfare of the entire church. 
On feast days, it prescribed that the choir be ruled by either two or four members of the chapter bearing copes and staves, known as the rulers of the choir. Each ruler carried a staff, known in Latin as a baculus cantoralis, as a sign of his authority, and it is theorized as a corrective instrument. Whether to beat time or to beat unruly choir boys, we will never truly know. You will also see how the priests participating in the ceremony share among each other the responsibility of singing the office, as five of them alternately begin to sing the first portion of the antiphon, which begin the, each of the appointed psalms. Every day the priests prayed five psalms at Vespers, which together with the offices of the other hours of the day allowed them to pray all 150 of the Psalms of David over the course of the week. A common feature of Vespers in the use of Sarum, which is not seen in the Roman or Tridentine form of Vespers, is the singing of an additional chant after the chapter called the Sponsory. It is called such after its structure whereby one or more cantors sings a verse which is responded by the whole choir. The responsory was added in the Roman Rite's Reformed Liturgy of the Hours after Vatican II, the form prayed by most Catholic clergy and religious today, although, as I said before, usually read in a private manner, not sung in church. Following the responsory, we have the hymn of the day. The hymn appointed for tonight, Iste Confessor, long predates the serum use, but for tonight's celebration, we have the privilege of hearing the even-numbered verses of the hymn played solely on the organ, using a surviving arrangement by Thomas Tallis, one of the last great composers for the serum use before the Reformation in England gave way to the Book of Common Prayer. The climax of Vespers in both the serum use and its more recent forms is the Canticle of Mary Magnificat. As the Magnificat is sung, the priest performs an incensation of all the altars in the church. In the case of the Princeton Chapel, in addition to the high altar, there is one in the side chapel that the priest will go out to sense. On the way, he will also sense the holy icons or images, which you will hear more about shortly. The priest then surrenders the thurible to a server who senses him, the rulers, and the rest of the choir in turn. A more elaborate description of this ceremony can be seen in your programs and studied if you take them home. Those of you who attended or saw the Durandus Institute Serum Vespers of 2020 may remember that the Feast of Candlemas ranked high enough to justify having two priests sense the high altar at the same time, though tonight's celebration of St. Chad only prescribes one. This brings me to answer another question some of you may have. Who exactly was St. Chad anyway? St. Chad was a monk, abbot, and finally a bishop of the Anglo-Saxon church in the seventh century, long before the Norman conquest that I spoke of before, and even a hundred years before Alfred the Great began the consolidation of the several Anglo-Saxon kingdoms into his dream of a united England. Most of what we know about St. Chad comes from the writings of the Venerable Bede, who lived one generation after him. Chad was a rigorous ascetic and reformer of religious life, when a bishop-elect by the name of Wilfred went to Gaul to be consecrated as Bishop of York, he was gone so long that the king declared the see vacant and appointed Chad to the role. Chad took up his post as Bishop of York with zeal, but when Wilfred finally returned, again one of the many problems in an age before instant communication, the Archbishop of Canterbury declared Chad's Episcopal orders to be unlawful. Chad, who felt unworthy of the position in the first place, happily resigned the position. He did so with such a readiness to obey that for Theodore, Archbishop of Canterbury, it was proof that he was worthy of the bishopric after all. Theodore consecrated Chad a bishop himself, or else ratified his orders, and eventually sent Chad to become Bishop of the Mercians, then considered a frontier people in what is now known as Litchfield. Through his missionary zeal, Chad did much to Christianize the people of Mercia, and he was widely regarded and acclaimed as a saint upon his death. Thus, he has a feast day in the use of Sarum's calendar of saints. After the Reformation, devotion to St. Chad diminished, but with the Gothic revival of the 19th century and the reestablishment of the Catholic hierarchy in England after centuries of persecution and restrictions, St. Chad was upheld as an example of how the English church grew from the faith of the monasteries. St. Chad's relics were preserved in secret after their dissolution, and eventually was enshrined at St. Chad's Cathedral in Birmingham, designed by Augustus Pugin as the first Catholic cathedral to be built in England after the Reformation. So far, I've spoken entirely of things that have happened long ago. 
As an amateur historian, speaking of the past is truly one of my favorite pastimes, sometimes bordering on a vice. But I want to end this portion of the talk by connecting things to the present and the future, by commenting briefly on how tonight's event will end with benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. The custom of benediction, which is to say by the priest blessing the assembly by bearing aloft a monstrance containing the Eucharistic Lord consecrated under the appearance of bread, did not exist in the medieval English church. Monstrances were originally developed not for the Eucharist, but rather for the display and veneration of the relics of the saints. Nevertheless, it grew to be the custom among English Catholics after the Reformation that the liturgical Vespers was fittingly followed by the popular devotion of benediction. So entwined are the evening services of Vespers and benediction that among Anglo Anglicans of the Anglo-Catholic wing who believe in the doctrine of transubstantiation, there is a shorthand for this, the initials ENB, even song and benediction. It is no secret that since the middle of the 20th century, the Catholic Church in the West has suffered a decline in many observable metrics. Sunday mass attendance, vocations to the priesthood or religious life, baptisms and marriages, to name a few. Among these also, so it seems, is a declining belief in the doctrine of transubstantiation or the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharistic species of bread and wine. The Catholic bishops of the United States have attempted to respond to this challenge by engaging in a three-year Eucharistic revival campaign, culminating this summer with a National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis. And so here, with this event, it was felt that we should take advantage of the fact that the Princeton Chapel, thanks to the generous spirit of cooperation between the Aquinas Institute and Princeton's Office for Religious Life, does in fact keep a tabernacle for the reservation of the Blessed Sacrament. And so, while the use of serum did not have a rite of benediction, we will conclude Vespers with a rite of exposition and benediction featuring exclusively music and texts that were known to those worshiping in England on the eve of the Reformation. For the average worshiper in medieval England, every mass was a moment of adoration. It was rare in those days for anyone but the most devout to receive communion more than once or a few times a year. But from the king to the peasant, faithful hearts were stirred when the priest at mass just after the consecration elevated the host for all to see, even if faintly from a distance or through the rude screen that separated the people from the altar. It is said that in these ages of faith, the throngs of people would shout at the priest during the elevation, yelling, raise it higher, sir priest, raise it higher. And at every, ma every church when high mass was sung, the tower bell would ring at the elevation so that even the farmers in the field and the workmen in their labors could turn for a moment and adore. Tonight at Vespers, we are taken to the past with pr the prayers and ceremonies, the power and the glory of those who came before us in faith, joining with the prayer of the universal church. At benediction, we are taken into the future to a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. At the moment of benediction, let us say in our hearts, like those of the medieval Christians, raise it higher, Sir Priest. May the work of the Durandus Institute, the Catholic Sacred Music Project, and all others involved with this celebration continue to lift hearts and souls closer to God through our studies of the history of liturgy and sacred music. Next this evening, I would like to introduce David Clayton to speak to us about the use of sacred art uh, and the icons in our celebration of Vespers. David is a renowned teacher and artist and serves as the provost of Pontifex University and as the artist in residence uh, and program director at, uh, at the Scala Foundation, one of our co-sponsors for this evening. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so, why images? Uh, well, the hope is to deepen our participation in and engage the whole person in a multifaceted uh, worship of God. Saint Augustine, uh, who famously said that those who sing their prayers pray twice, um, I think he would have said that our worship would be multifaceted in this worship. 
uh, in the fact that we have art, we have beautiful architecture, which is a feast for the eyes. Uh, we have beautiful music, of course, in which we're not only singing or listening, but also singing. We're encouraged to join in if you look at your program. So those who don't like to sing, uh, swallow your pride and do it. It's a, uh, this is a, not a concert. The hope is that we participate. And um, the goal really here is to uh, affect us supernaturally so that we go out into the world transformed um, and affected by the beauty that we see here, which speaks of the divine and through the worship actually connects us with the divine. And so we're transformed and we go out into the world and contribute beautifully and gracefully to the love of our neighbor and demonstrate the love of God. The Scala Foundation, um, which I'm part of, uh, and uh, my wife, Margarita, is here, she's the executive director, is devoted to the transformation of American culture through beauty uh, in education and worship. And so it is by being transformed ourselves and contributing on an individual basis that we will do that. And our hope is that perhaps just a little bit today that each of us might be affected. The choice of images, I described this in the program a little bit. Um, we have the traditional core imagery and the pictures are in the program. I realize they, they look very small up at the front if you're right at the back. Um, but uh, if you are in a parish church, even though they're small, you would have been well acquainted with these images because you would come up and you would venerate them and through many cycles of the liturgical year become familiar with these images. So when they're incensed, you would know exactly what was happening. Um, this is the first time you've had an opportunity to see them, so you, you won't be aware of them, but you can have a look at the, the program and then just be aware of what's happening at that moment and focus on the person who's being in, incensed through the and honored through the image. Um, so how do we pray with sacred art? Um, well, I've, if you go to the bookshop, you'll find uh, books on praying with icons that might be an inch thick in some cases. Um, I must say, I don't know how they fill the book um, because actually it's fairly simple. Uh, you pray as you would ordinarily, uh, but look at the person who you're praying to and pray to them through the image. And it really is as simple as that. So we know that, the, that Christ, he told us, he is the image of the Father. So when we worship the Father through the Son in the Spirit, which is what our worship is, uh, we do so, or we can do so, by focusing on the image of Christ. Um, when we worship Christ himself, by extension, of praying to someone through their image, uh, we would look at the image of Christ. So each time Christ is addressed or the Father is addressed, think about the image that's in front of you and perhaps talk to the person through the image. Um, similarly, with Mary, uh, talk to her. When we sing the Magnificat, uh, she is singing to us her words and those words become our own. So. She is speaking to us and we can imagine her talking to us through that image. Um, and we also can ask Mary and Saint Chad, the image just below me here, uh, to pray for us. So we don't worship uh, Saint Chad or Mary, but we ask them to pray for us, just as we might ask uh, our friends or our family to pray for us. Uh, we can't do so um, in person, they're not here bodily, but we can talk to them as though they were through the image um, and they will be praying for us in heaven and actually participating in this liturgy in heaven with us as we worship. Uh, this is the heavenly liturgy which the beauty of this occasion uh, is hoping to give us some sense of. Um, if we just think that for all the beauty that we're going to hear and see today, it's just a, 
a mere uh, fraction of what uh, God in his glory will be like when we are in union with God in heaven. Let, let us hope we all get there. Um, so the choice of imagery, uh, the, there is a tradition um, of having three core images. So on the left, typically, you would have Our Lady showing us her son. We actually have two pictures of Our Lady, bo both of them painted by an artist who's here today, and you can meet her afterwards. She will be uh, standing next to the images. She doesn't realize, I've just told her she will be. <laughs> She's just down there. Um, so we have the Russian-style icon uh, of Mary on the right as you see it, and then on the left, it, she only managed to complete it partially, but it was looking so gorgeous. I said, bring it along and let's have a look. It's an ornate uh, line drawing of an icon of Mary. So when the icon is incensed, try and I, if, look at the, the icon directly or look at the image that you have in front of you. Um, and through that, we, under, we uh, have a symbol of Christ's life, his earthly life, and through, he received his humanity through Mary. Um, and then, typically centrally placed or closer to the center, we have a beautiful crucifixion, again painted by Joanna Belchia, who uh, painted this uh, image especially for the occasion. Um, and this represents the passion and the death of our Lord. Uh, of course, we suffer with him and he suffers with us in this life, but there's always hope of the resurrection, which is uh, portrayed in the, image, the face of Christ below me, which is of the resurrected Christ. So through that, we have the arc of salvation history, which is the life, the passion, and the death, and the resurrection of Christ. And each of us, through our lives, participates in some way, and through the church, can participate right up to its consummation, and we hope that will be the bodily resurrection in heaven. But what it means in this life is that there is always hope that transcends any suffering, um, and the liturgy unites us to Christ in a special way. It has a special power to do that. Um, a word on the, the style. I should mention, actually, before I do so, that the two small icons below me um, are painted by a young, uh, young artist called Ander Scharbach from Baltimore. Um, and the icon of St. Chad was commissioned especially for the occasion. Uh, what I asked of the artist was to imitate, to, 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 to create something in a modern form, a contemporary form, that made use of the style of English art during that pre-Reformation period, which was heavily line-focused, uh, description of form with line, muted colors, and then decorative borders. And I think you'll agree that each has interpreted that, interpreted that in their own way, and marvelously. It's very beautiful work, um, and I hope it will help you to deepen your worship. Um, a word about the general style here. The, a uh, style of liturgical art is, uh, this is broadly speaking, iconographic. You, you will be aware of Russian and Greek icons, I'm thinking, many of you. Uh, but this part participates in that tradition. The, the art that we commission uh, is uh, painted in a Western variant of that style. Um, and the point of this art is that it, is, uh, it has been developed over generations, the style that is used over generations and centuries uh, to actually help us worship well, so that, it, that is, we open our hearts to God and then give that love back to him, which is what we do in our worship, and we go out and love our neighbor as ourself. And so how would you gauge such a thing? It's certainly not by how we feel when we look at the art. It's not a, a, the response. It's not intended primarily to be emotional. Um, it's, it's actually meant to touch our hearts, the place in the center of us, the, the vector sum of our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions, and encouraging us to go out 
and live the life of good Christians. And it, over centuries, it is found that this style works harmoniously with the, uh, the worship. So we not only have a harmony in the beautiful music that we're going to hear, the harmony the, uh, which describes the beauty of the cosmos, which is effectively the, bears the thumbprint of the creator, um, is extended out into the art and the architecture. It's, it's a unified whole. And even the words of the Psalms that we're going to sing stimulate the spiritual imagination in such a way that it opens our hearts to God and one hopes, inspires us to love our fellows as ourselves, as we're called to do. So here's the hope that each of us will be able to do that. I just want to say a brief word about um, how this might be relevant to us today. Um, clearly, we're reaching back into pre-Reformation England in many ways here, as we've heard. Uh, but I would say that, the, if the, as I've mentioned, if we engage the whole person in worship and impress the pattern of Christ upon our souls, which is what worship is meant to do, we're transformed supernaturally. Uh, we then take this out into the world and we can contribute one personal relationship at a time to the transformation of the culture. And um, it's really true to say that the use of serum is particularly relevant to Americans, strange as it may seem. And I speak as a, an American, as of last Easter, uh, who was brought up in England um, in that the Anglo-American culture from which the American nation emerged and the principles that are encapsulated, for example, in the Constitution um, and the, the understanding of America of the Founding Fathers emerged out of the, uh, the society formed by the spiritual imagination in its earliest formation in England through the Sarum use, but then through its descendants in the Anglican, the Episcopalian, um, and many Christian denominations who worshipped here and particularly sang the Psalms together. And it's uh, a hope of mine that we might do that. We might sing the Psalms together, all Christians, uh, once more. And uh, this is particularly true for those denominations that use the Book of Common Prayer, which, which as James mentioned, uh, comes directly out of this inspiration of the, of the serum use. So the hope here is that by seeing this beautiful, wonderful service, that we might, it might actually touch our hearts and take us both up and uh, bring us down to earth in different ways. So it elevates our attention to the heavenly liturgy, that through the beauty of this, we can imagine it in its perfection, something even more beautiful, which is the heavenly liturgy, the saints and the angels worshiping God in heaven, and that we participate in that um, as Christians here today. But also, I'm hoping that some of us might be inspired then to, to pray the Psalms in our home, humble prayer in the family, um, that is itself a participation in the heavenly liturgy in its own way, will be the driving force for a new and beautiful culture. And if, if we pray the Psalms humbly, uh, then in its own way, if our hearts are in it, the pattern of Christ will be impressed upon our souls and we can go out into the world and contribute beautifully and gracefully and create a noble and accessible high culture, a culture that reflects the dignity of Christ just by being imperfect people but doing our best, inspired by God, to offer beauty to the world and love to the world. And everything that you see here today has been developed in order to try and inspire us to respond to God's grace and to be open to God's grace and to desire that for the world and for ourselves. And this is the joy of being a Christian. 
It's the joy of the Christian life, um, and it is open to everybody, and it's a gift that we are free to accept tonight and free to take to others and offer to others joyfully after this occasion. And I hope some of you may be touched to do so. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a lovely meditation. Lastly, speaking this evening, uh, I'd like to introduce Gabriel Crouch, who will be telling us about the sacred music that will be sung during our celebration of Vespers. Gabriel serves here at Princeton University as the director of choral activities, and also as the director of the choir Galli Cantus, who will be singing for this evening's Vespers. Thank you, Peter. I would just like to say, first of all, what an enormous honor it is for us, and I speak as a member now of the performing group, Gallicantus, because it is a performing group and not a liturgical choir, and I'll, I will explain a little bit more about why I, I see that as significant. But what an enormous honor it is for us to be involved in this event, for us to be able to translate our love um, and immersion into this music that we venerate and have venerated all of our lives into um, a practical use for which this music might have been written. It's not something I ever thought that I would be able to be involved with, and I'm sure I speak for my colleagues when I say that too. So I would just like to express our thanks to all of the parties who have brought this evening to life, including, of course, um, the Scala Foundation, um, which we just heard so eloquently represented, and also to the um, Aquinas Institute, the Catholic Sacred uh, Music Project, and all of the other sponsors of tonight's um, event. I mentioned that Gallicantus is a performance ensemble and not a liturgical choir, because it's true. Um, but what is also true is that we all grew up in a liturgical music-making setting. Um, you've already heard the uh, Westminster Abbey mentioned um, this evening, and I, I'm, I'm proud to say that my musical education took place at Westminster Abbey. I was a chorister there from the age of seven, and the gentleman who's singing the low bass part next to me, his name is Giles Underwood, um, he and I have actually been singing together since we were seven. We were both boy choristers at Westminster Abbey um, for as long as we can remember. Um, but there is also a great deal of other musical experience in the group, including at the cradle of Catholicism in England, the, the Cathedral of Westminster, where um, three of us have had a, a deep experience in, have served that institution for a number of years, and then also uh, um, at, at several other Catholic foundations in, um, in England, including the Brompton Oratory. So one of the things that's been very interesting for us as we have prepared to sing for you this evening is to draw together our different understandings of the culture of chant singing, because one of the fascinations of this music is that um, it is affected not only by um, the liturgical use of Serum, of York, of Paris, or, or, or anything else, but also actually just according to local custom, there are all kinds of differences in the interpretation of decoding these complicated um, sort of insect-like neumes in Gregorian chant that we grapple with. So, um, so it, it has been a, a, a nourishing experience for us to draw on uh, on all of our education and try to come to a kind of uh, a, a centered understanding of how we should sing for you this evening. Um, we heard just a few, a few moments ago that we are reaching back to pre-Reformation England for the liturgy. Um, I think it's probably fairer to say that we are reaching back to counter-Reformation England for the music. 
Um, although that's not entirely true, but, I, but there, is a, there is a strong thread of the, of the central years of the 16th century, the years of Mary I, 1553 to 1558, um, in the music that you will hear um, during this service. Um, there are three composers represented, Robert White, uh, John Shepherd, and Thomas Tallis. Thomas Tallis, of course, is an absolute giant of the 16th century in England and probably one of the very few composers to have come from England who I think all musicians could say made a significant global contribution to the advancement of music. If we think about it, there aren't that many names, even the proudest Englishman as I sometimes am. Um, we, we can't make that claim about many composers beyond Tallis, Bird, Britain, Purcell, I'm struggling. Um, much, as, much as I love the, the, the music of the country of my birth. Um, nonetheless, these three composers whose music we're gonna to sing tonight all have their very, very special qualities. And I, and I wondered in the short time that I have, and I, and I, and I realized that, um, that, that we must, uh, we, we must um, have a, a moment of silence before we begin this evening, so I'll be brief. But I would like to just give you some things perhaps to listen for as you digest the music that we sing tonight. Um, let's begin with John Shepherd, since we're going to sing his music first. You're going to hear the Matins Antiphon Liberanos Salvanos, which we'll sing from the balcony behind you. Uh, John Shepherd, um, a very interesting character in English music, um, he was born uh, 10 years after Tallis, but died uh, right at the very end of Mary's reign in 1558. And most of his music is written for what you would consider to be um, a demonstrably a Catholic liturgy. It's, it's, most of his uh, sacred music is in Latin, not all of it, but most of it is in Latin, and, and most of what musicians would consider to be his great music is in Latin, and very much follows um, the what you would consider to be a, a Catholic uh, approach to liturgical music where the music is florid and ornate. You'll hear um, long successions, cascades of notes on single syllables of music. In that sense, you might, uh, you might see this as old-fashioned music, and I use those words in the best possible sense, where John Shepherd is looking back to the music of his forebears, looking back to the heyday, pre-Reformation, England, to the heyday of the use of serum, um, to those composers who adorned um, a, a music volume called the Eton Choir Book, which is, which is the sort of primordial document of, of the English music of the, um, of the Renaissance period. Um, John Shepherd was the informator choristarum, the, the head of, of, of choral music making at Magdalen College in Oxford, and Magdalen College was very much a conservative institution. Um, there is a, a rather shocking story associated with Shepherd's time at Magdalen College, Oxford, uh, which I'll tell you in just a moment, but I'll just, I'll just mention to you first that it is ordained in the foundation of Magdalen College, Oxford, that the antiphon Liberanos Salvanos be heard twice every day. And so it won't surprise you that John Shepherd wrote many settings of this text. The one we're going to sing this evening, his first setting, um, is built upon what is called a cantus firmus. So it's, a, it's a, a fascinating musical device where a Gregorian chant is heard sung very, very slowly, whilst polyphony is is, um, is set floridly around that cantus firmus. What's unusual about this setting is the cantus firmus is in the bass. So you'll hear a very, very slow moving and very low bass part with woven polyphony above it. It's a very, very beautiful effect. The, um, the story around uh, uh, Shepherd's life, which I, was, which I was just going to share with you, was that um, in the late 1540s, at the time when Cranmer's purges were really taking hold in England, it's early in the reign of Edward VI, um, an, e um, an evening service in Magdalen College, it might have been Vespers or Compline, was raided by um, a group of Calvinist agitators um, some of whom were connected to the college. Um, the service was interrupted, the choir books were torn up, um, the sacrament was defiled, the altar was 
uh, trashed. And it is, um, it is thought even that a member of Shepherd's own choir was part of this agitation. So, so this really took place at the time, um, at the time of the Reformation when, um, when all of the conservative bastions of English music were uh, one by one being brought low. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the really severe consequences of this was that certain cultures of English music making were lost, at least for a time, including the singing of boys. Um, there were, by, by, the, by the time Cranmer really got hold of this scene, there were very few places in England where boys were still allowed to sing, particularly after the Chantries Act. Um, uh, one of those places was the Chapel Royal and another was King's College, Cambridge. But even there, even in those, in those, um, uh, in those bastions of, of choral singing, the, 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 the population of boy treble singers was reduced drastically. And generally around the country, that training for boys was lost. So when um, Mary acceded to the throne in 1553, there was this level of skill which had been brought low and which needed to be restored. So one of the fascinating things, one of the ways that we, we have to date music that was written in the 1550s is whether there are parts written for high voices because that tells us whether the music was written at the time when boys' voices had, when, and when that training for boys had been restored to a level where they could take their place once again in the singing of the liturgy. So that's John Shepherd. Um, Robert White is the composer of the Magnificat. Robert White is really an Elizabethan composer, not, uh, not really, I mean, he was alive during the reign of Mary, but he was a very young man. He died in his 30s in 1574, uh, probably of the plague. But when you listen to Robert's, Robert White's music, we'll sing his, his fantastic Magnificat um, this evening, you'll hear again that this is old-fashioned music. It's very florid, long flowing lines of what's called melismas on a single syllable of music. This is very much the music of a composer looking back to the old days. And one of the reasons why we, we think Robert White was so um, devoted to the past is that Robert White's father-in-law was, um, was a, a composer called Christopher Tye, who was one of the giants of the, of the era of Henry VIII, of the heyday of the use of serum in England. Um, you'll also notice when you hear this Magnificat that there is a part, there is a very high treble part in this Magnificat. Um, our ensemble Gallicantus does not contain a high treble. We are one bass, one baritone, two tenors, and one countertenor who's just walked past me. I think my time is running out. Um, so um, you'll notice that there is a high treble in this Magnificat, so we're very grateful for the services of one of my students at Princeton, um, Madeline Cushion, who will be singing that high part. Finally, just on, on the music of Thomas Tallis. Tallis was a fascinating character who basically lived through the whole century. He was born before all these composers and he died after all these composers. So he, and he lived, lived um, a good 80 years, um, wrote music under the reign of Henry and through all of the, um, the tribulations that followed Henry's death and was very active during the reign of Edward VI and Mary I and was also one of Queen Elizabeth's favorites as well. So he was a very, very adaptable composer who had to write music in a lot of different idioms in order to survive and to succeed. Um, I've put a few thoughts into the program tonight about the Serum Litany, which was probably composed by Tallis, which you're going to hear this evening. But uh, this is one of the fascinating documents of the reign of Queen Mary I. Um, and it was probably heard during a procession very early in Mary's reign at a time when the country was uh, waiting expectantly for news of an heir, because um, in this in this very um, uh, 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 fragile moment in English history, where this the, the only surviving Catholic heir of Henry VIII was on the throne, obviously the Catholic Church needed an heir uh, from Mary in order to survive, knowing that the next in line for the throne was Elizabeth who was a Protestant. And so it, at this vulnerable moment, um, the, the country seemed to be very uh, sensitive to news from the royal chamber. And, and, uh, and, and prayers were loud and vocal and processions were public um, in the pursuit of calling on um, 
the support of the divine to, um, to assist um, in, in creating this royal heir for Mary I. And so uh, this Serum Litany was, was probably composed and heard um, for a procession to, to celebrate, um, in, in, in an unfortunately premature way, to celebrate the, the rumored news of Mary's pregnancy. Um, we will sing it this evening without the verses which refer specifically um, to this rumored pregnancy because um, that belongs very much of its time in 1555, but the, but, but the litany as a whole is a fascinating document um, of the time, and in its uh, source material, this litany is followed by um, the famous talis motet, O Sacrum Convivium, which of course is a communion, a Eucharistic uh, motet, but um, uh, because of the uh, be because of the presence of the sacrament at these processions, it is believed that this Eucharistic motet was also performed during these processions um, immediately after the hearing of the litany. So I hope that gives you just a few thoughts about the music that you're going to hear this evening. And as I say, it is an extremely meaningful and precious opportunity for us to sing it, um, not in a concert context, but in the context in which um, it would have originally been heard and the context in which the composers would prefer it to be heard. And with that, I will leave you. Thank you. <laughs>